All right, folks. Welcome to the March 9th meeting of the North Texas Archaeological Society. I am so you can't you can't hear me in the mic. Oh. Okay. Is that better or worse? Yeah. All of the above. Is that better? Okay. Welcome to the March 9th meeting of uh, March 9th, 2023 meeting of the North Texas Archaeological Society. So happy to see so many folks in the room tonight. I know there's a little bit of weather <clears throat> on the way up. Uh, so thank you for joining us and thank you for all of you who are joining us via Zoom. Before we get started, our slides are not gonna work. There we go. Uh, we have a few things, a few general announcements. The first of which is that, as you all can see, and I remind you every month, meeting snacks and refreshments are back. If you'd like to volunteer to bring all of us some food on the second Thursday of every month, except for June and December, please see Steve Lowe to sign up to do so. Look, I've got a sign out. I'm going to Otherwise, you all are going to be getting uh, unused frozen baby puree from my house because yes. our kid has gotten through that phase. Uh, <clears throat> we'd like to welcome our new members from the month of January. We welcomed 15 new members or in February, 15 new members in the month of February. The society is growing and growing and growing and growing. <clears throat> this is where I remind you that if you're a current member and you have not renewed, now is the time. <clears throat> okay, so if, you're, if you've been receiving those emails from us over the last two months, and we're reminding you that you need to renew and you're thinking to yourself, well, that doesn't apply to me. Uh, maybe that does apply to me. I'm not entirely sure. Feel free to send uh, me an email about that. And I am going to send out one final reminder before March 15th. If you have not renewed by that date, you no longer receive wonderful announcements from me about volunteer opportunities, about our meetings, et cetera. This is also a reminder that... <clears throat> We have free NTAS, NTAS memberships for students. So if you're a student and you would like to get a free membership, please visit the website, fill out the application, send us an essay and a class schedule, and we will provide you with a free membership to the society. February uh, was a very good month for donations as well. So thank you to those of you who sent donations in. Those help us cover things like the scholarships I just described and the scholarships I'm about to describe, uh, as well as helping us have this wonderful room and the ability to have speakers like we have tonight joining us through the power of Zoom as if they're in the room with us. Uh, one volunteer announcement. Um, Saturday, March 18th, uh, NTAS is offering another site recording opportunity at the Fort Worth Nature Center and Refuge. Please contact Jimmy Barrera. If you don't know who Jimmy Barrera is, I'm not sure what you're doing here, but he's right here in front. <laughs> Next month, April 2023, uh, guest speaker is Dr. Mike Adler, who will be joining us in the room here in Fort Worth to discuss the lessons of Picaris Pueblo 
uh, an ancestral cosmopolitan center in the northern Rio Grande. So <clears throat> our first announcement on this last general announcements page is that NTAS scholarships are now available to any NTAS members for the March 24th through 26th, 2023 Archaeology 101 Academy. The only requirement is that you are an NTAS member in good standing. I've sent this out in a couple of different announcements over the last week. I'm aware that when you go to the website, it still says that a requirement is that you be a student or a teacher. You do not have to be a student or a teacher to apply for the registration fee for the Archaeology 101 uh, TAS Academy on March 20, from March 24th through March 26th. So if you have any interest at all in doing that academy and you want a little bit of help doing so, send in a scholarship application and we will review it and then we will more than likely <laughs> provide you with the $100 registration fee. Uh, that's a good time to remind you all that uh, NTAS scholarships are also available for the NTAS field school in Nacogdoches. I said it right, get it on record for the first time ever in my life. Um, so please, please, please hop on the website, look through the requirements of that, send us applications uh, for that field school. It's a wonderful opportunity and NTAS uh, is proud to help folks experience it. And with that, I will turn it over to our March, 2023 guest speakers, Tom Ashmore and CA Majin. All right. You ready for me to speak for a few minutes, just for a second? Let me stop sharing my screen really quickly. Right. You want me to share mine? Tom can share his. Okay. There you go. CA, you're ready to go. All right. I'm ready to roll. That's good. All right. Well, Basically, I'll be a quick, mine's a short intro to this thing. So uh, first of all, we want to say thank you to NTAS for the opportunity to uh, do this presentation tonight. And uh, we look forward to your questions and any input that you have. And, uh, and at the same time, we would like to say uh, a big shout out and thank you to James Everett, who uh, helped us with the uh, trinomial for the uh, ring bet shelter and uh, at Tarl, and we needed some help there. So James took care of that for us and we got the trinomial and the report uh, that uh, Salve Turpin had turned in. And uh, we were doing our due diligence uh, in uh, trying to research this project and we pursued as everything we could. So, uh, and also we would like to, uh, I would like to say thanks to, uh, uh, Dr. Chris Lentz and Dr. Charles Frederick, both guys are good friends of mine. I've learned a lot from them in the past, and uh, I thank you, and uh, I try to make like a sponge when I'm around you guys. Uh, also, uh, Jimmy Barrera, and the last of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you to uh, Thad Steele, the uh, owner of the property, and uh, without his blessing, uh, we wouldn't be here. And uh, uh, we thank you, Thad, for that opportunity. And the other thing I'll, I'll finish up with uh, in closing is that uh, since this is on the uh, uh, pictographs at Myers Springs, one of them, uh, this whole thing was launched by a question from Thad Steele when he approached us with the, uh, the you see the, uh, the uh, pictograph of the, uh, conquistador there on your screen there. Anyway, he came to us with uh, a cutout in stainless, not in stainless, but in steel. And we could see the outline. And we had previously promised him 
that we were not interested and we were not going to try to do anything with the pictographs because they had already been studied. And uh, so this is where the rocket got the fuse lit when he asked us questions. What do you guys think about this? And he had taken a picture of it on the wall down there and had it cut out in steel. And then from there, the question was from him, what, what do you guys think? What can you tell us about this? So here we go. And I will uh, train this over to uh, Tom Ashmore and he will run through the slides. And again, we thank you very much for the opportunity to present tonight. Okay, Tom. All right. So as you can see for yourself that we're actually giving you uh, two presentations in one. Uh, both of them are in the same general area. Uh, Myers Spring is close to the uh, Pecos River and the other one is on the Pecos River, the lower Pecos River area, uh, which is the Ringbit Shelter. So we're gonna go through the first one first and give you our interpretation, a uh, new interpretation uh, of the uh, Myers Spring what we're calling the conquistador pictograph. And I think that uh, when you see the various pieces of it that we're going to detail for you, uh, we're hoping that you'll agree with us on this one. Uh, we're so proud of this one that we have made it our logo for uh, the West Texas Archaeological Society here. So first of all, uh, the Myers Spring area. You can see it's a, a very desolate type of area in the very lower Pecos region, not far from the Rio Grande. Uh, it's a very good spring still running today. Uh, and if you look on the right side there, you can see with the red star, basically where, where we're talking about here on the map. And of course, in the bottom here, you have a better picture of the uh, local area. And we'll go through the entire pictograph area, which covers uh, about a 100 foot uh, wall on the pictograph area here. So here you have the two, two uh, images looking each direction, south and north. And you can see the, uh, the wall is significant. It has been worked on by various uh, tribes of Indians coming through from the archaic times, but mostly through the historic times. Uh, you can see on the wall on the right hand side there, some of the pictures and we'll, we'll show you some of the close ups of them. So here you have some of the more famous of the pictographs, uh, the famous what the uh, ranch has for its uh, logo on its uh, fencing as you arrive in the ranch is the uh, the, the buzzard there. Uh, you have uh, on the bottom below that, you have what is actually another buzzard. Some people have mistakenly called it a uh, flying fish. But if you look at it closely, you'll see that it is in fact a buzzard. Uh, you also have a missionary period to the right of that where you have the priest on the right and uh, dancing Indians doing a ceremonial dance. And below that, you also have another uh, image of uh, Spanish priests on the bottom there. And you've got the Indian hunting buffalo and you've got Shumla there working on it. They have done a very good 3D uh, rendering of the entire pictographic wall there. So as I said, this is a new interpretation. This has been uh, what we believe has been overlooked and misinterpreted by just about everybody up until now. Uh, you can see where, where it exists on the wall there and the size of it in comparison to the other pictographs on the wall and the close-up of it on the right there. This is uh, Forrest Kirkland's uh, rendering of it. And you can see it's very accurate. He did a very good job on it. 
And uh, you can see the comparison there between the right hand and the left hand side there. And so we've been, uh, we've had, had people looking at this since the 1930s period. So as uh, CA told you, the landowner created laser cuttings of these. Uh, he picked out some of the rep, some of the more uh, important, what he thought was uh, good representations, and had them created into metal art. Uh, he was nice enough to provide us with some sets of those metal arts, and it was while we were looking at the actual metal art depictions where it suddenly came to to us that uh, we might not be looking at what many people had been interpreting to be Indian. And it looked, uh, there was, and the first thing that we saw that uh, stood out was what was in his hand. And what was in his hand and what is in his hand is a really a Spanish mat, matchlock Harkibus. Uh, this is this matches almost identically to the Harkibus of uh, renderings, and this was very common to the Spanish conquistadors during the exploration of the North American and Southwest area. Uh, it it came from Europe. It was much longer in Europe. Uh, in fact, it was so long that at times they had to have a stand to hold it. But when the Spaniards came over, they they cut it down for mobility. So you can see on the left side there, you have the harquebus of the Spaniard style. Uh, and this is 15th through the 17th century. It was somewhat accurate to about 100 meters uh, for somebody who was uh, familiar with its firing mechanism. This is the uh, European harquebus, uh, and you can see uh, you have the accoutrements that are are used to load the harquebus and fire it. Uh, I have a video of this, but it, we we're not going to show it here because of the zoom and uh, internet capabilities. But you can fire about eight to ten rounds per minute for somebody who uh, knows what they're doing. One of the things that uh, we had to overcome right away was that in uh, 1938, a published book uh, referenced this particular image and said that they thought it might be a uh, rabbit stick. Well, we can see that uh, very quickly that the rabbit, this cannot be a rabbit stick, which rabbit sticks are about one and a half feet in length, and this is up three and a half feet in length. In addition to that, on this wall, there's three more images of actual rabbit sticks. And we have those three images here. One of them is uh, now to this day uh, washed out because of the, it's in the lower part of the wall and has been washed out from the uh, weathering and flooding. Uh, and that was the one that was put in by uh, Kirkland, and, and that's on the lower left here. And you can see that this person, uh, this Indian has thrown the rabbit stick, and that is a depiction of a rabbit that he's throwing it at. Uh, what is uh, on there, connected to their hands there are uh, netting. So those are rabbit nets that they were, they would capture the rabbit when they stunned it. Uh, you can see on the uh, upper right one, he actually has it tied to his hand with a, a type of a rope. So yeah, this pretty much indicates this was not a rabbit stick. The second item in, that we have is uh, that stands out is the boots. Uh, this was not common to Indians but it was very common to the Spanish conquistadors. And you can see in the bottom there, uh, indication on a uh, uh, depiction of the types of boots that they had. This would have been a, an unusual uh, something worn that the Indians would have 
uh, seen and wanted to depict into a picture. They also had full length outfits, which the Indians did not have, especially during this period of time uh, in the 1500s. And you can, again, looking down at the bottom there, you can see that they were, uh, this was common to the conquistador uh, period and their uniforms. The next thing that we have is the shield. Uh, this was the one thing that uh, many people were uh, concluding that the shield was uh, because of Indians. But uh, these shields, uh, you can look at the, uh, the, the type of shield it is and where it is actually split in the middle. And that is the type of shield that was carried by the conquistadors. And you can see that this one uh, actual image of a real shield is, comes from the Metropolitan Museum of Art here. So that matches also, again, the conquistador weaponry and uniform. The next thing we have is the helmet. The helmet uh, was something that they had, it was very common to the Spanish conquistador. And you can see that the comb on the top of the helmet was indicative of that type of helmet along with the feathering. And uh, what many people thought might be the head on this pictograph image is actually the helmet, as you can see by the lines that we've drawn here uh, that match up properly with the helmet instead of the head. Another important thing that is on the wall that is uh, next to next to the conquistador, because this is a picture image, uh, a story type of image, is the horse. Uh, you can see that it's painted in the same uh, pigment here, and you can see with the exaggerated neck that is definitely a horse. Uh, unfortunately, part of it has been spalled off on the front where uh, the nose is. Uh, and it is, this is a period of time where in this particular, what we're going to show you, what we think was the uh, Humano group of Indians uh, that were on the plains had probably never seen a horse uh, up until this time. So we think that this is a uh, very good indication that their, their, their story of first look at something they'd never seen before had to be put on this uh, story wall here. As we continue to look at this, uh, we continue to notice other things that were in the same pigment uh, below the horse and trying to figure out what this was. So we're going to go through this and show you uh, how this fits with the entire picture. So we'll go one, one thing at a time here. First, this grouping down here below the horse. You'll see that both in the uh, Kirkland depiction, and it's starting to fade now, but it's still slightly in there, uh, faded. There is a something going from the back of the horse to a circular object, a ring type object. And then there is a faded line going from the ring type object to the object at the back. This object in the back, I believe, is the depiction of a two wheeled cart as if you were looking at it from the top side. So they didn't have a way to really depict the interpretation properly uh, as an artist would. Uh, but they they knew that this uh, this this was a cart, and this was a you can see it's got a wheel on the bottom and uh, then another wheel at the top there, on the sides. So this was their attempt to depict a two wheeled cart, which was also very common in the conquistador period. And the picture on the bottom shows you very clearly. Uh, what we're looking at here with the strap going over the back of the horse 
and then connecting back to the cart. And then finally on the bottom, uh, which has been overlooked completely, is the priest. Priests were always walking in the conquistador expeditions. And you can see by the hat, for example, that this is very likely a depiction of a priest or a friar. So who was this and how did it happen? Well, Antonio de Espejo was about the first one that uh, ever encountered the Humano uh, Indians in the plains. They were on an expedition uh, coming up from Mexico in 1582. They set out on the mission because they had word that two of their friars had been killed in northern New Mexico. And they were on an expedition to find out if that, in fact, was true. They had 15 soldiers, 115 horses and mules. On the right-hand side, you can see what their path was, their route was, uh, in blue, heading up to the Rio Grande and then up to Santa Fe. Again, you can see the uh, route that they traveled. And they had they kept a journal, which was very, very helpful in us trying to figure out if this was, in fact, related. Uh, in the descriptions, they referenced the Harkabas in seven separate uh, times in their journal, that they used the Harkabas either to intimidate or actually in battle with various tribes that they came across that were hostile. Uh, they did learn that the two friars had been killed from the Indians that they uh, encountered on the way up, and they decided to continue on their way, and they were going to, in fact, uh, enact ret retribution on the particular tribe that was named, that was the Tiwa tribe. They pushed into uh, the area. They first went a little bit, they were exploring at the same time, but they finally in, ended up in the Tiwa territory and basically uh, battled against the Tiwa and punished the tribe for the killings of the priests. When they completed that, they decided they were going to head back to Mexico using the route of the Pecos River. They headed south, and nobody had uh, done this uh, before. They headed south down the Pecos River, crossing uh, down through the uh, town, what is town uh, Pecos nowadays. Uh, and they came across three Humano Indians that were out hunting. The Indians were friendly. The Humano were uh, traders and friendly uh, Indians. and. They told them that they were heading through interpreters that they had. They told them they were heading back down to Mexico using the Pecos River route. The Indians told them that if they did that, they were going the wrong way because they were going to end up in a place that they did not understand that they were going to end up in. And uh, that's been proven uh, many times. So on the, on the uh, right-hand side of the screen here, you can see the original route that they planned to take, which is in blue. And then you can see the route that the Indians uh, who were then uh, encouraged or contracted by them to act as guides to bring them back down into Mexico to what is now the Presidio area. So they took them down what is now Toya Creek. By the journal that they uh, left, this is the uh, route that they took, starting at the top, the Toya Creek, uh, down to Balmeray. And then after that, they crossed through the mountain region to the Fort Davis area, and then down to what is the Marfa area, and then to La Junta, which is now the Presidio area. So this is the route that they took that uh, comes from their journal. 
So who were the Humanos? Well, they were mentioned in the Spanish documents beginning at this particular time, 1583, and continuing on. <clears throat> the uh, written records showed they were mobile hunters in the Trans-Pecos region, often traveling great distances, and they followed the, they were the first bison hunters uh, long before the uh, Comanche and Apaches came down into this region. Here we're looking at the region that was known to be Humano and all of their various uh, tribal uh, parts. And you can see here that it's, it was a wide region. There were there are many Humano that were up and down the uh, Rio Grande River, but we're looking here at the Humano were mostly going up into the uh, hunting into the area of the bison plains. Uh, they covered the Rio Grande and they all the way down to the Del Rio area, over to the Presidio area and northern border. Uh, they had the, as far as San Angelo Concho area and up to the Colorado rivers. And the red dot that you see on the picture there is Myers Spring, which sits right in the middle of their territory. So we looked at the uh, route that they took when they were traveling up and down to their hunting grounds. And you can see here that coming from Del Rio on the south, there was several different stops that they would make and they're well-placed uh, stops that they had for water. Uh, the San Felipe Creek in the Del Rio area, the Seminole Canyon Creek, Myers Spring, Independence Creek, and Oak Creek. So this made a perfect route uh, and they were not on horseback. This was all walking. So this would be a good uh, multi-day walk, but a good stopping point at every single place and it was well-placed uh, distances. Zooming in a little bit, uh, as we come down Highway 349, the main route going down to that region now, uh, that was still the most likely route coming down to that area. And uh, you can see here by the arrows that uh, they would cut across to go down to the Myers Spring. This is the most likely traveling route, uh, making it to Myers Spring. So the uh, De Espejo expedition is already accepted historically as the first contact between the Spanish conquistadors and the Humano Indians uh, of the region that was for the Plains buff, uh, Bison hunting Humanos. Not the Humanos that were along the Rio Grande, but the Bison hunting Humanos. And this is based on Spanish documentation. So we believe that the pictograph details match all of the aspects of a conquistador representation, the harquebus, the clothing, uh, earliest period of exploration into the new America. Additionally, the depiction of the horse and wagon, the walking priest, is most probable uh, the uh, Trans-Pecos story on, on the wall of the first contact between European conquistador explorers and these particular Indians that made their way consistently up and down this particular route for their hunting. And because of that, we think that this makes this pictograph one of the most important images on stone of early Texas history. We'll let you look at this for just a second more, and then we'll move on to our second 
presentation. So now we're gonna move over to the Lower Pecos River area and a, another group of pictographs that has been identified as the ringbit shelter and who we think this represents. This is a large pictograph image uh, near the Rio, Rio Grande. And we think it's likely a depiction story again of the Lower Pecos Indians, not particularly the Humano at this, in this particular story, as they watched a scouting party from the Gaspar Castano de Sosa expedition. And now this one was in 1590. So now we're talking about about seven years later. This was not necessarily conquistador, but it is at the very end and the end of the conquistador period as it transitioned into the Spaniard, Spanish occupation period. So who was uh, de Sosa? He was the Lieutenant Governor of a small area in Northern Mexico. He was unable to get official permission for his expedition that he wanted. And he was fearing that he was going to be arrested for corruption because his predecessor was arrested and tried and convicted for uh, corruption. And he believed that uh, whether or not it was true or not, he was probably going to be uh, fall under the same types of accusations. So he departed without permission in 1590. From, and you can see there from Almaden, and he intended to head up to Santa Fe under the auspices of an exploration and moving to the Santa Fe area. Uh, under the Spanish uh, occupation in that area. So his journey was both a flight from prosecution as well as exploration. He, he took in his entire, the entire town that he was uh, living in at the time, 170, including all the soldiers, they all went with him. They took all their livestock, all their possessions, and they were going up there for a permanent relocation in a very slow moving wagon train. And you can imagine it was very large. This was not like a conquistador expeditions, and especially the fact that they had no Catholic priests accompanying them. So we're, now we're talking about the route. Uh, this again was a personal journal on a, on a daily or semi-daily uh, written documentation. And it was detailed in a book called A Colony on the Move. He crossed the Rio Grande in the area which is now the Del Rio area and proceeded to move north uh, to the Pecos River. He was intending to follow the Pecos River north instead of going the traditional way of the Rio Grande. His scouts found the river, but they uh, came back to the uh, train and told him, uh, this isn't gonna work. We cannot cross this river and we can't really follow the river either because it's it's uh, the the way that that the rocky nature and the uh, precipitous area is too difficult to get get through so they decided to head northeast to the devil's river area when they got to the devil's river they found that it also was inaccessible they couldn't even get to the water to get their water. 
So then at that point, they turned northwest and continued in that direction, uh, sending scouts out to find the Pecos River as they went along. The scouts came back and they reported again that uh, they found the river, but it was inaccessible. There was, they couldn't even get to it, let alone uh, follow it or get across it. So they continued uh, in a northwest way. Uh, and then again, the scouts were ordered after a little while to go back and find them for a third time, the, the Pecos River. And this time they couldn't even find it. And the reason is probably because the Pecos River takes a bend at the point that they were trying to find it and heads away from them. So the, now they said they can't, they came back and they said, we can't even find the river now. And they just decided to continue on a Northwest route. So they went for a little while longer and again, they were sent out on a fourth attempt and they finally found the river. And this was at a junction uh, just north of the Independence Creek area. And they reported that, in fact, they could make it to the river and there was accessible area along the river. They got, they went to the river and they continued up the east side until where they found uh, what is now Fort Lancaster and the Oak Creek area. And from here, they continued on and found the Pecos River uh, from that point and then continued up the Pecos River. So on this picture here, you can see uh, what I laid out as the path from the journal that they laid out on the left side. And in comparison, you can see on the right side, Highway 1024. And you can see that it matches almost exactly with the highway, which is the most accept accessible way to get through this region, which is very, very difficult. So you can see on the left side of Highway 1024 as an example, all of the different uh, canyons and draws and, and everything that would be just absolutely horrendous to try to get through. So the Highway 1024, which is now, is about the only way that you could go. And that's the way they went. This site, uh, we know how difficult it is to get to because we've been to it twice. Uh, it was archeologically recorded in 66 and again in 86. And it was given the name of the Ring Bit Shelter. Uh, Concha Valley and Ira Ann visited in 2010 and 26. And you can see here the pictures of the region close to the river. And you can see how difficult it was to get through, even with the roads that are there at this time. It is definitely a four wheel only uh, access. And, at, and they actually had breakdowns with four wheels four-wheel vehicles had problems getting in and out of there in these cases. So we'll look at the uh, pictograph as a whole here, and then we're going to break it apart piece by piece to try to tell you what we think the story is that they're trying to tell here. The first thing is the three most obvious elements is the name of the shelter, ring bit, which you can see on the front of the horse here is quite obviously a, a Spanish ring bit uh, bridle and bit. And we have the example on the right hand so you can see that. Then we have the bolero hat, which is proper to the period of this expedition in 1590. And finally, they were still carrying at this time the cavalry pikes. And you can see that's quite clearly a cavalry pike that he's uh, got in his hands there.
you have two uh, horsemen here, two cavaliers, and in between the two horsemen is a depiction of a bison. The head of the bison has been spalled or washed off in, by weathering, but you can tell by the hump that that is, in fact, a bison. Uh, you see that both of those soldiers are looking down while they're on the horse. They're looking down, both carrying pikes. There would be no reason for, uh, in actuality, in reality, a bison to be sitting between the two. So we think that this is uh, a depiction of them watching the bison herd below them, but the Indians needed to depict this in a way that they're, they're explaining that they are looking at bison. So what they did was they put the bison in between to tell the story that this is what they're looking at as they're looking down. You can see here on the bottom that the there is a wide basin of the river here. And we do know that bisons were traveling up and down this river during this period of time. And this has been documented by Solve Tur Turvin in, a, in a, a paper that they put out in 1987. So during the, uh, this period, hundreds of small uh, autonomous ga hunter-gatherer Indian groups were displaced from the Mexico area by the Spaniards who were advancing north. They had to retreat, and they retreated northward. And some went to east and west, but many of them went north. These were called the Cohiltecan Indians by many who have studied the various groups there, and they basically grouped them together based on language. So this is many different groups of Indians, but have generally been generalized to be one group, but there was many different groups, but they're called the Cohiltecan. In 1580, a uh, large effort was put forward to capture many of these Indians for slavery. And the Indians were uh, ex escaping the slavery by heading north and into the region of the, of the uh, Pecos River. We think that they uh, went into the Pecos River because it is so inaccessible uh, for anyone that was not familiar with this region. Uh, it's, and it's, to this day, it's inaccessible. So going back to the pictograph, you take a look at the main pictograph of the Indian that is on the wall here on the right hand side. And you'll see the way that they have depicted the headdress with the feathers on the top of the headdress. And then if you look at all the different ones around it that have, many have been washed from weathering, but you can still see the same type of headdress on many of the heads or at least pieces of the uh, of the head that is not weathered out. And you can see that the what they're showing here in, in a kind of a, a three-dimensional picture is that while the soldiers are sitting there looking down into the region of the of the river at the bison, they were actually surrounded by the Indians who were watching them. And that's what they're trying to tell the story of. So the pictograph is undoubtedly Spani Spaniard soldiers carrying those, the pikes as, of the uh, cavalry. The uh, De Sosa caravan was the only expedition 
with had that had conquistador like soldiers that attempted to pass through this extremely difficult region. And if you've ever been there or ever go there, you're going to understand very quickly, other than that one highway, it is still to this day, very, very difficult. The only reason he went through there was because he was essentially in flight. He was in flight from the prosecution. So he was not going to take the route that uh, was he could easily be uh, caught or the, the soldiers from uh, Mexico could catch up to him. There are pictographs all up and down the Pecos River region here, which indicates there were a substantial number of Indians living in these side canyons along the river. These canyons provided the shelter, the clean water, the plants and foods that they needed the animals for hunting, the fish, fishing that they needed. So act, in actuality, if they knew how to live off the land properly, this was not a bad area to survive in. As long as you stayed by the river, close to the river, and in these, these side canyons. This was a period that bison were well known to be traveling up and down the river. And all of these things that we've mentioned here are very good sor sources for survival in this area. And it's very likely based on the fact that we know that uh, there were many slavers that were looking for them, that they had good situational awareness of what was going on around them all the time, and they were not going to reveal themselves to anybody especially the, the Spaniards. So we think that this uh, pictograph is a story of this event uh, as a story displayed on a wall uh, in this hidden shelter, still to this day, uh, mostly hidden, but we think it's, it's a, a very good depiction story uh, of this period of time. And here we have the entire picture for you to look at one more time. And that concludes our two presentations. And I guess we'll take questions at this point. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, we'll start with some questions in the room and then we'll uh, move over to Zoom where several came in in the process of your presentation. Uh, do we have any questions uh, in the room to start with? Yes. Does Carolyn Boyd look like the Um, The question is, has Carolyn Boyd uh, had a chance to look at this rock art? Uh, we have, well, yes, Carolyn Boyd and her entire group has done an entire, uh, uh, has looked at this rock art. However, when we contacted them, they did not have any um, reporting that we could, that they could find in their archives. Uh, so, we're not sure if they just looked at it. They didn't, if they did look at it, they doesn't seem to be that they did um, any serious reporting on it. Uh, we originally asked them for the uh, trinomial and they were not able to find it. And, and Tom, this is James, you, you provided Shumla uh, with uh, very detailed reports on both of these sites with photos and lots of uh, text to go with that. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Yes, the report uh, was sent to uh, Shumla, uh, one of the first uh, recipients of our report. 
and they they responded back to us after a, after a bit, and uh, we've all had conversation on it with with Shumla down there, and uh, we haven't gotten anything from them saying that, you know that they disagree with us or anything like that, but but they are certainly looking at at particularly the Conquistador location as something of of very strong significance because of what of what it represents first contact. And uh, and it's been overlooked, and we I myself overlooked it because I've been there two or three times before. Thad Steele came out and asked us what we thought about this, you know. And it's like, you know, I had to stop and go back through my photographs of that site to see what it was he was talking about. And uh, it, it's that easy to overlook, and you assume that these things uh, might be uh, particularly Indian. You think he's got a shield or something like that out there, but. Uh, when you really study it and look at it, uh, that's when I started seeing it myself. Is you looked at the detail. Any other questions? Yep. Follow up. What do you, what is the thought on where it's below the uh, heavily colored uh, head of the headdress? Um, his legs are kind of splayed, and then there's something below. Yeah. So the question, let me, <clears throat> Tom or CA, on the right side of the screen, there's uh, sort of the displayed man or person. What is, uh, do you all have any idea what the imagery is below that person? I believe it's another Indian. Yeah, I would think it's it's hard to tell. It's it's all some of that stuff gets washed over time and uh, just from exposure to the weather, and that's one of the sad things that we see down there in the lower Pecos. And and we commend uh, Shumla for doing what they're doing. They're recording these things where we can have a permanent digital record of them because when you look at what Kirkland saw. And you go to Meyer Spring and you see what CA sees today when he goes there. And it's like the whole bottom half of some of that stuff is gone. And it's like, uh, it, it's really, uh, Shumla is doing, I, I commend them for what they're doing. And uh, they, I think they feel, we feel like we're trying to work in cooperation with them. And that was our effort. And we certainly weren't in a, you know, in a contest, so to speak, because uh, we recognize them as being the, the authority on on those on rock art, and that's their that's their uh, that's their strength. So, one of the things that it appears to me is that the on this particular depiction we're looking at right here, it looks like they were attempting to in, to show the Indians in in a perspective that showed them in a circular way around these soldiers. So you've got closer up and then farther away type of uh, depictions. Yeah. We, one of the things we came up with on this whole thing, Tom and I did after we were studying it and we were talking with Thad Steele about it is that we, it came to us, this, this is a story, this is a storyboard for these people and it's the way they communicated with one another. It, it, if you look at it in that point of view, because they had no other means of communication and they, you know, and for them to draw a horse on the wall is something that, you know, at that period of time, they didn't have. And the Spanish, you know, when they stole the horses from the, from the Spaniards, it, then they became a light cavalry, you know? And uh, we know what that led to, so, uh, uh, we we think it's their way of communicating what they saw and and what maybe they were letting their friends know that this could be a danger in the area or something in the area that they hadn't seen before. So that you know you can speculate on that, but uh, we think we call it we call these things a storyboard basically. Yeah. Yeah. Analysis of the uh, the question uh, is: Have there been any chemical analyses of this of this pictograph or or the other? I don't think so. I don't think so because our understanding is that, and I'm I don't think Shumla has been to the uh, 
to the ring bit shelter. I could be wrong there, and I don't I don't criticize them, but they've got this is a real small shelter, and it took us uh, more than an hour and a half to get down from the ranch <laughs> property to the river itself to get to this thing, and it is it is that remote to get there, and uh, uh, I know that Shimla has done some analysis down there, but I have not seen uh, any of their reports. I would like to know that. I would like to know that question too. Yeah, I'm not sure that they've done um, chemical analysis even at Meyer Spring. And they uh, yeah, I, they were I very careful to uh, do photographic, but yeah. uh, I'm not sure that they did chemical. <clears throat> We'll have to ask them. <laughs> Any other questions from the room before we move over to Zoom? No? Okay. All right, I'll uh, read a couple of comments, try to speak loud for the crowd. Um, as uh, This is from Thad, as the landowner of Meyer Spring, I learn new bits of history every time Tom gives a presentation. We have discovered so much in the last year about the site, amazing stuff. Um, from Tim Dalby, many of the groups may have been Carrizo Kumakrudo. Often these were called Kobaltecans, how I pronounce it, in error. Uh, Carrizo Kumakrudo traded with Waztecan to the south in Mexico and traded their shell carvings with the Waztecs. I don't know. It wasn't a question, it was a comment. Yeah. Um, Are you, can you hear that, Tom? And, uh, yeah, I can hear it. Part of it. I, I think uh, I one thing I tried to do was try to determine if there were was any recordings or historical uh, renderings of Indians with the types of headdress they have, and I was not able to to find any renderings um, of that type of headdress. So the only thing we have to go on is the, the, the history books that we were able to compile the information from. And I know that there's a, a lot of debate that has gone back and forth on the naming of the various uh, groups. Uh, and whether or not they should all be falling under a, sim a you know a single name, um, we're not really trying to uh, get into that discussion. We're just we're just using that as as a, the most common reference. Okay. Uh, many folks saying thank you, excellent presentation, and then we get to a question from. Tom Middlebrook, has there been any recovery of period artifacts from ring bit shelter? Ooh, I don't know. Uh, we'd have to go back and uh, I know Salve Turpin did a did a uh, basic uh, forum for uh, Tarl on that, but I didn't. I don't. I, I know that because with James Everett, we were able to read it, but I don't recall that they recovered anything there. And uh, when I was there with the archaeology group uh, on that uh, tour along the Pecos, uh, we did, we, we were strictly boots on the ground and there was no shopping around or looking for anything that was there. So uh, because it is such a remote location, uh, I would say if, if Salve Turpin didn't uh, find something or didn't look, you know, didn't pull something out, then uh, I know that my, the group I was with, uh, we did not, so. Yeah, it's not, there's nothing in the reporting from the recording. I think it was only recorded yeah. and they moved on. This was not going after one single um, uh, pictograph shelter. They were going up and down the river yeah. trying to record everything they could find and, and just moving on. There's a whole there's a whole series of uh, sites in that particular part of the river on both sides of the river that were recorded, and uh, I'm not sure if, if Salve did all of those or what. But uh, thanks to James Everett, we were able to get find out the trinomial there, so we could have a a, a, a specific reference to a location. 
Okay, um, more folks, um, Skipper and Michelle say outstanding presentation. Thank you, very interesting. And then a comment from Chris. Uh, bison in parentheses without head at ring bit site does not appear to have eroded head. Consider it to be the killing of a bear. The, the killing what? Of a bear. Killing of a bear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hey, uh, I think a lot of this stuff is whatever you, sometimes whatever you think you see and one guy looks at it and somebody else looks at it. So uh, it, you never know that the spalling and everything down there is just, uh, it breaks your heart when you see it because it's, it's this stuff is going away. And uh, the next generation that comes along is, you know, they're not gonna have anything to look at. <clears throat> Yeah, this is this is definitely interpretation. Yeah, uh, our in, our interpretation is based on the hump on the back. Yeah. Well, guys, bears have humps too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey. Do we have any other questions from Zoom? Uh, no other questions. Um, Sunny comments, the hump on the back does look like a bear. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a bear. <laughs> it could be. So then the, the follow-up question is, if it's a bear, does it change your interpretation? No. Right, yeah. <laughs> Do we have any other questions in the room? Yes. So where that was taken on the wall, the question is, um, what other contextual information from pictographs uh, exists around <clears throat> the very focused pictograph that we're looking at right now? Uh, I don't recall anything else. This was really not very, uh, not a very wide, maybe ten feet or so at the very most, and it was a real, it was real shallow, uh, exposed to the weather, that type of thing. Uh, we didn't measure it or anything of that nature, but I, I took numerous photographs of it myself, and uh, it, it was pretty well uh, within a confined space. Put it that way. It's not, it's not like Myers Springs where you've got what, 100 feet, 100 and a half, or you've got pictographs painted all along the wall. This thing is, is more of a small pocket type of a, of a uh, display. And I think, CA, uh, you went and saw many of the other uh, yes. pictographs down the river, and nothing yes. was, nothing was nothing. of this nature. No, no nothing. Uh, we A lot of what we saw down on that trip was... Uh, some of them were up above our head, and we had to speculate on how they would have gotten up there. But uh, a lot of them were just not, uh, that it was not anything you could really define. And it was open to conjectures to what, what you might be seeing. And uh, we were we were on the river for three hours or more. And uh, it, it was an arduous deal to go. And uh, it, you're you're out in the middle of nowhere and there's no 911 and you've got to rescue yourself. So uh, it, it's remote. And uh, I don't re remember seeing that many pictographs, so to speak, but we did see shelters and things of that nature where they lived. And uh, we didn't have time to do anything else other than this was a boots on the ground type deal. Uh, no, no trowels, no shovels, none of that kind of stuff. It was strictly boots on the ground to walk it, look it, get a feel for what's there. Okay, so we have any other questions in the room? No, anything else from Zoom? More comments, very interesting, thank you. All right, well, thank you all very much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Tom and CA. One more round of applause for the presentation. Thank you, guys. <laughs> we enjoyed it. It's a lot of fun. Look forward to the next meeting in another month. <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much. And with that, I'll bring the March 9th, 2023 meeting of the North Texas Archaeological Society to a close. Thank you all for coming.
All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.